Hello. How are you guys doing? Well, I just got done filming all my videos. Alex is home from work today. He did not have to work. So he's upstairs watching TV. He was nice enough to watch his TV with uh, his headphones on while I was filming videos. And now I just put all my stuff away. And it is 6.42 and I'm getting ready to watch my video back. Oh, I need to plug my phone in. Um, watch my video back. Um, but I went to the post office today and I wanted to, I got a, a, something and so a box and I wanted to open it because I don't know what's inside of it. I'm so excited. I mean, I opened the box, but it's like, you know what actually I'm going to do? I'm going to open it over here on the couch where you can maybe see a little bit better. Okay. Guys, can you guys see that at all? Okay. I know it's kind of a bad angle, but the light is better in here. So, I got this big box today from the post office, and I got a very, very nice card, which kind of has some private stuff in it, so I'm gonna leave it to myself, but it is from Julia, so thank you, Julia. And she said there's a little thing in here that she made that's inspired by PP. so I have no idea what that is. I'm really excited. Um, that she kind of spoke to my recovery, so, um, the first thing that she sent me um, was this bracelet. It says serenity bracelet, blessing bracelet. May you experience the feeling of calm and peace. Wear this bracelet as a reminder of the protection that surrounds you and the love that embraces you always. And, um, it ha oh, it has a serenity prayer on the back of it. Um, the recovery prayer, serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And there's actually a really long version of that as well. Um, and then she said, this bracelet, although I'm not religious, helps me know that I'm protected. It, I hope it does the same for you. Oh my God, I love that. Tanya has these. And if you, you can't really see it, but it's like this really nice, like fine gold thread. And then it has this like thing on the end of it. That is so cool. Okay. And I love it. It was like in this little bag. I love little bags like that. So I'll be keeping that to re-gift for somebody else or something else. Okay. I, you guys, I love when you put little notes on all this stuff. Fragile, made by me, with love. Oh my God. Okay, I'm opening it very carefully. And there's a note inside. FYI, Pee-Pee's tail is fragile. Oh my God, it's a little pad that has I'm trying to be very, this tape. I don't know where you got this tape to wrap this, but it's so pretty. Oh my God. Oh my God. I have to show this to you on paper so you guys can see what it looks like. Look at that. It's Peepy, -pee, and he's got a little blue heart and his white chest. And look at his little tail in the back. Oh, that makes me, that makes me so happy. I love that. Right down to the little gray on his face. Oh my God, that is so perfect. Oh my God, it looks so much like him. I love that. Oh my God, Alex is gonna die. Okay, I have to set it somewhere really careful right there. And then there's like another, oh no, that was, okay. I love that little box too. Thank you so much. And then in the bottom, everybody always sends me these pads. I literally, you guys, I use so many of these pads. So um, she sent me this uh, wolf. Oh, it says wolf, like the wolf pack on it. Wolf pack. It has notes. Okay. The next thing. She looked, let me just tell you, this is like some care. Like you guys are so amazing. Bubble wrap and then a wrapped present underneath it. This tape, I need to find out where you guys get this creative tape. And so you guys know that I collect magnets on the refrigerator, right? 
fringe glass magnets. And look, they're all dogs. And there's a little chihuahua in there, oh my god. Do you see the little chihuahua right there? Oh my god, I love those. I'm gonna immediately put those in the fridge. I'm gonna go in there and put those in there in just a second. Those are so cool. Oh my God, Julie, this stuff is fantastic. Thank you. What is this? Oh my God, I've seen these before. Somebody sent me one of these before. Patty Wax Library, John Steinbeck, Smoke Birch and Amber. And now that you don't have to be perfect, you can be good, John Steinbeck. And it's a candle. And they're like these library scents. But look at how cool this candle is. Do you see this? Oh my God. It's a rainy day in October. And I'm gonna find a copy of Something Wicked This Way Comes by Ray Bradbury. And I go into this old bookstore that only has rare books. And there's a fire in the back and leather chairs everywhere. And one last copy of Something Wicked This Way Comes. Oh my God, it smells so good. What is that a mix of, I wonder? See bottom for safety information. Okay, well, wait. This is called Steinbeck, in case you guys are interested. These candles, I will tell you, I have another one over there, the library one that somebody sent me. They're fantastic. I kind of would like to know where people get them. Do you order them online or where do you get them? Bibliotech, they're called. It doesn't have what's in it though. Smoke, oh, smoked birch and amber. And I just told you what it smells like, so. Oh my God, that is fantastic. Thank you guys so much, or thank you, Julia, so much. And I'm gonna put little PB right over here. If I put him over there, I'm afraid, because I take that stuff down every day, he'll get hurt. So I'm going to put him over here. Because this is where I have, like, all of my little things. See? Aw. PB. I love that so much. I'm so happy. Julia, you have completely made my day. Because can I just show you outside? I love rainy days, but... Rainy days and Mondays always get me down. Carpenters. Okay. Now I'm gonna watch my video back and then, oh my God, I just, addicted. I'm gonna watch my video back and uh, this will be so funny. I just got in the mail. Make Beauty Memories, Saks Fifth Avenue. Is it for me or is it for Alex? It's for me. So it'll be interesting to see if I know any of the products that they're putting, they talk about in here. Wouldn't that be funny? Because I'm a beauty guru. Nope, don't know. Kiehl's, I know Kiehl's. But I don't know a lot of these products. Oh, Chanel. $695 for this white caviar cream by La Prairie. Christian Louboutin nail polish. Oh, fifty dollars each. Other oh, and for, and then the sheer lip colors are ninety. The bottles are cool though. Tom Ford makeup. Bobby Brown. I guess I should probably look through this and see like, shower gel, gel douche. Forty-four dollars for some body scrub. No, thank you. I am cheap. Blossom Girls Joe Malone, London. Should we smell it? Mm. Yeah, I like that. That's nice. I would buy that for somebody. How much is it? Trio of three. Nashi Blossom Cologne. It doesn't even say how much it is. $140. For how many ounces? 100 milliliters. I don't know how many 100 milliliters translates into ounces. Do you guys know? Gucci Bloom. with all the perfumes in here. Dolce Gabbana. Oh, Bond Number 9. Here's a new one. Spring Fling. You love me? Okay, so I used to wear Bond Number 9. Bleaker Street. Let's smell this one. See? 
I don't like that. Mm -mm. Killian exclusive. I do wish I had more where you could smell them though. I think that's kind of fun. The Aramis Perfume, $148 for 3.3 ounces. That's not bad at all. Honestly, it's a big bottle. I could do a whole magazine video on this. Don't even think I couldn't. Oh, gosh. Anyway, my life is so exciting. And then we got... Penny, Penny, I won't say her last name, associate broker for Century 21. She says she wants us to sell our condo, I guess. No thanks, Penny. Anyway, I will be back a little bit later. Bye, guys. Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing tonight? I do not feel very well. And um, I know why it is, <laughs> so... Alex brought a pizza home from Costco, and uh, we sat there and watched part three of the finale of the uh, Real Housewives of Atlanta reunion, and I ate like four pieces of this, I just spilled water everywhere, of this cheese pizza, and uh, like as soon as I got done eating it, my stomach just started hurting. I just can't eat stuff like that anymore, you know, like, um, I've just noticed that recently my stomach is like really, really kind of like fine tuned to like not eating like greasy shit. And whenever I do, like, I don't feel well the next day or I don't feel well that day, which is probably um, a sign that healthier eating, you know? So anyway, we watched that, and then we watched, um, we had both watched RuPaul's Drag Race, but we hadn't watched Untucked, or I think I mean, he might have watched it, I don't know, but, so we watched Untucked, and I was like falling asleep in the chair, and Alex was like, babe, why don't you lay down for a little bit? And I was like, okay, so his best friend called and I went to go lay down and Tani had texted me. She was like, do you want to go get a fountain pop? And I was like, no, I'm like really tired tonight. And um, so I just kind of was like driven all day. I got so much stuff done today. Um, but I lay down, and then Alex came to bed, like, right after that, right after he got off the phone with his friend, and it was early, and so, uh, I, like, fell asleep, but then he was, like, my alarm was going off, he's like, can you turn your alarm off, please, because I need to go to bed, and I was like, yeah, so I turned it off, and that was at, like, like, 10, 15, I think, or something like that, and, um, fell back asleep and I woke up and it's now like, like 1.30 or 2 or something. What time is it? 1.56. So, um, yeah. That has been my evening. I had this like really strange nightmare and um, I woke up I don't know if I've talked about this on here very much, but when I was a little kid, I used to have night terrors. And um, there's a difference between nightmares and night terrors, but like I had horrific night terrors when I was growing up. Like where I couldn't move in my nightmares and I would wake up and I had like drenched the sheets with sweat. And um, if you've ever done that before, it's like a really weird feeling. It, like, feels like you wet the bed, but, like, all over. Like, you soak the bed. It's like you ran a marathon in your sleep. And, um... I haven't had that happen in a really, really long time. But I did have a horrible nightmare tonight. And it was weird because, um, I was in my bedroom that I grew up. And it was, like, me and, like, 20 people. And we were, like, in my bedroom. 
and it just was like the weirdest dream. We were like hiding out in there, and I had a bunk bed growing up at my mom's house, and it was like this really heavy bunk bed, and um, we like pushed it up against like the door, and we were like, but then it like turned into this kind of like this survivalist camp kind of thing. It was weird, like how we were gonna like get water from the creek out back and like what we were gonna, how we were gonna get food. And it was just, it was the most bizarre dream. Like it was a nightmare, but it wasn't a nightmare to say, I don't know if that makes any sense. I think I've talked about this on here before, but I used to have like, well, I know I've talked about this on here before, but I used to have reoccurring nightmares. I had this like horrible reoccurring nightmare of my mom. Um, and I was always like at different stages of trying to get her out of the house. I used to have this dream when I was a kid and um, all the way up, well, I'll tell you, but anyway, so in the nightmare, I would always be trying to get her out of the house and I couldn't get her out of the house and she was very zombie-ish. Like when I was trying to get her out of the house, like not looking, but like walking, like zombie-ish. And um, sometimes I would get her to the car and no matter like what age I was when I had the dream or the nightmare, I was always really little in the nightmare. Like I was like six or seven. And um, so sometimes I'd get her you know, in the car and I would get the car like down the street and then, like, we would have to go back or something, and a lot of times, I wouldn't be able to get her out of the house, but I would get out of the house, and I would go to the neighbors across the street, and then I would, um, like, look back. I could look over across. We would, like, be ducking down in the window, looking across to the house, and the blinds would be closed, like, the curtains, which we didn't even have curtains that closed like that in our house, but, like, and I would see my mom getting, like, like the shadow of her getting stabbed. But she always died in the dream, and like in these, it was by this killer that I I never saw the killer, um, but I just like knew that the killer was there, and I was terrified in the dream, and um, I stopped having that nightmare when my mom got sober. Is that not so weird? So I'm sure symbolically the killer was like drinking, and I was you know scared of my mom's drinking. I think that's so interesting. When I was a little kid, my mom really got into like dream interpretation and the significance of dreams and things like that. And she never believed that like dreams foretell, foretold the future and I don't believe that. But she read all of these books about dreams and you know, Freud's interpretation of dreams and Jung's interpretation of dreams and she really believed in um, dream journaling. Let's see if the deer are here tonight. This is like a night they usually like. It's like kind of rainy outside. and But anyway, um, she really believed in uh, journaling your dreams and like as soon as you wake up, like writing down like your dreams and than like looking for themes in your dreams and um, in a lot of her journals that she kept or she writes her dreams and then she didn't keep like a specific journal for that but like they're written in between there and when I go if you go back in there and read you can see like where she has certain places like circled like certain words that are like themes throughout her dreams and it's interesting the way that she like interpreted it but um so she got me a dream journal when I was young and she was like, you should write down all your dreams. Um, it'll be a good way for you to remember your dreams because supposedly the more you write down your dreams, the more you'll just automatically remember your dreams when you wake up. And um, so I did over time started writing down my dreams. Um, and I remember a lot of my dreams now. What's really interesting is that when, and I believe that dreams are a combination of your subconscious working overtime, of issues that you're working on in your life, as well as like things you've seen like throughout the day or the week, you know? So I think you have to be very, very careful when you pick symbols to interpret in dreams. Because, you know, if, like, let's say you're drinking a glass of milk and then you want to go and, like, 
you know, look up what milk means in like a dream. Well, you could have seen a billboard sometime throughout the week that said, you know, drink milk, it does the body good or whatever. And that's why it's in your dream. It might not have any other significance than that. So I think you have to be really, really careful when you look at that stuff. I also am not a believer that you like, you know, where you pick like one symbol. I mean, I used to do this and I did it, you know, when I worked in treatment, the kids loved to pull out the dream dictionaries and do all this kind of stuff. And I had all of them, but you know, they would like, you know, it, picking a symbol and then like a rainbow and what does that mean, you know, or, you know, a butterfly, you're going through a change of life or something, you know what I mean? Like, I don't think it's that, um, you know, I don't know. Dreams are sometimes literal and sometimes figurative. And, uh, I used to work with a psychiatrist back in the day. I've told this story on here too. And he just was a genius when it came to dreams. But, the other thing that's weird is that what you remember of your dream or your nightmare, and let's say if, um, like you remember part and it seems like you remember a really long part, like the, oh my God, that dream was, I couldn't get out of that dream or whatever. That's really a fraction of a minute of a dream that you had at the very, very end, supposedly. Um, and that like our minds are like la, 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 with, with dreams, you know, what dreams may come. And um, it's weird because like I had a, oh God, I don't know. This was like a year or two ago. I started having these dreams where at the very end, right before I would wake up, like, let's say if, like, my alarm was going off or whatever, my dream would start slowing down. Like, literally, like, if I was sitting here talking, it would slow down. It, to the point where then it was almost like pages flipping in a book, you know, like, that you're looking at. And then I was like, what if dreams are no more than just, like, neuropses, you know, like, coming up with these, like, images... And what if that's what life is? You know, what if life is no more than just these flipping pages? If there's no real reality to it. I got very, like, there was, <laughs> you guys, I could, like, now you have to remember, okay? I love, like, shows, like, on the radio, like, Coast to Coast AM and all that kind of stuff and conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, the fact that we're really not having this experience, that we're just, like, eggs somewhere in space, like, flipping images in our head... <laughs> Um, you know, like, is not that far out of an idea for me, <laughs> so to speak. and write for a little bit and then I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do my videos about tomorrow and um, I'm like filming videos and then like thinking I post them and not posting them I did that on my Peterisms channel yesterday and then I posted the video from yesterday today which is irritating because I have it all ready to post and then I don't I don't post it. I don't know why. Um, like, I go in there and everything, and I, I always think that I hit publish, so... I do things so fast sometimes that maybe I don't realize what I'm doing. Half the time I do it from my phone, half the time I do it from the computer. Um, so I've got to figure out what I'm going to make my videos about tomorrow. And um, then I'm going to this with my friend Aaron... Um, she got tickets to go to this open house for a new women's halfway house in Indianapolis. And the woman that is opening it is actually somebody that's really well known in Indiana for, um, being in charge of... Of, in the Department of Corrections, specifically for all of the heroin cases. And um, I 
hired her and trained her back in the day <laughs> when she was just a wee thing and um so Erin like mentioned to me she was like oh do you by any chance know so and so like I know she's really well known you probably knew her from working back in the day and I said no or I hired her and trained her she's awesome I love her and um so she's like well do you want to go to this thing with me this open house I was like oh my god yeah I would love to so I'm gonna surprise her tomorrow and she doesn't know that I'm coming and I'm really excited and um, plus, that's not, you know, a realm that I work in anymore, so it's kind of fun for me. I don't know who's going to be there and who's going to show up, you know. Back in the day, that was my world. I'm sure I'll run into a few people that I know from back in the day. It's kind of a field that it's interesting. It's like, people either, st I guess this isn't a whole lot different. I was going to say something really profound, but I guess it's not a whole lot different than any other field. You know, it's kind of a field, addictions are kind of a field that, like, either you stay in and you work in for, like, your entire life or you get out of at some point. I guess it's like any other field, though. But, um, like, everybody that I know either worked in it and is doing something completely different. Like, I have a lot of friends of mine that used to be, like, counselors and now they do hair. A true story. And um, I know, like, two people that do that. And they just needed to do something completely different, you know? It is a burnout field, I will say. It's like... I wasn't burnt out when I left it. I just... Um, I just didn't... You know, I mean, I had done everything, you know? Like... I had done everything there was to do. Is kind of how I felt about it. And I think also, like, I felt like it was time for, like, the younger generation to kind of come up. And then when I started my practice, you know, I began by, you know, working with addicts and alcoholics. And then I worked with a lot of family members. And then I started doing, like, you know, couples counseling and stuff like that. And then that turned into me doing life coaching, which is completely different. And, um... And that was a very deliberate move because up till that point, I was getting a lot of like court ordered cases. Um, I was really uh, known at that time for doing like witness testimony and things like that. Not witness testimony, but you know, going before like cases and like speaking to somebody's like sobriety and things like that. I had done so much of that. And most of the judges in Indiana knew me. Um, most of the judges in Indiana still know me. They don't seem to ever kind of leave the field either. And I knew, like, all of the judges that, like, you know, had worked within the juvenile justice system and have been the directors of the Child and Family Services and stuff like that. And I loved it. I really, really did. But, like, at some point, it's like, you don't want somebody that's sitting in front of you because they're forced to be there or they feel like they're forced to be there. You know what I mean? So, um, that was why I just was like, I'm changing my practice and I'm going to do like life coaching. And financially I was at a point where I could do that, you know, and I could kind of do whatever I wanted to do. And I was writing and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I had some other business things on the side that I still have. And um, so, I don't know, life just worked out for me that way. And that was kind of my plan anyway, was to eventually just get out of, and not do my practice anymore. And um, it wasn't like I wanted to do my practice for 30 years. That was never my plan. And um, I miss it sometimes, you know, I like, I would say, like, I don't miss that as much as I miss working in treatment. Like, that every day going in, that craziness that you don't ever know what's going to happen on a daily basis. Like, it's lonely working in an office, you know, by yourself and, like, seeing, you know, one client after another. And, you know, in the last three or four years, it was, like, the majority of the people that I saw were, like, 40-plus, and they were all, like... Like, the, they were coming to life coaching because they wanted to, like, have their second career. They wanted to chase their dream, which I loved doing. I did, right? But it's not like there's a lot of, like, you know, 
crazy codes being called and people running and all, you know what I mean? Like, it's fun and you feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself. Um, I'm kind of at this point in my life right now where I'm like trying to figure out what my next move is gonna be, you know? Like, what I wanna do that's gonna be like drastically different. I went to my um, counselor today and we were talking a lot about that. And he was like, well, what do you want to do next? And I was like, I don't know, but I need to change some things up. And, you know, financially I'm very blessed in that I can kind of do that. Um, and he was like, well, what do you think your next move is? And he's like, you know, you've talked a lot about this book that you're working on. And he was like, would you like to do like speaking engagements with that? I could totally see you doing like speaking engagements. I said, yeah, I would love to do that. You know, I've done a lot of speaking in my life. I mean, not just on video, but, you know, like, no, I mean, back in the day, I used to do a lot of speaking engagements, and, you know, if I could have my dream, I would like to be a successful writer, and by successful, what I mean is that what I sell pays the bills, um, and there, to be honest with you, I think that's probably about 1% of all writers out there, um, I think there's this misconception that, like, a lot of writers that even writers that you know well, a lot of them have real, like real jobs because it doesn't, like you don't make money. You would have to have a bestseller. It just doesn't, books don't make what they used to make. Um, but I think that that would be like, you know, fun if that's what I did. And I was kind of telling him my plan of, we were, I was referencing like Anne Lamott and David Sedaris. And he was like, oh, I could totally see you doing that, you know? And obviously I have no plans of, you know, quitting YouTube. I love doing this, but I also feel like that fits into that, you know? I'm kind of having to decide what I want to do with my office because I use it, but now I use it, I would say, more for my writing than anything else. I mean, I have a couple projects a month that I'm still doing, you know? But I've even kind of, like, been, like, not doing as much of that. And that was kind of a decision that I made in Florida. Like, I just, I don't know. I, it's weird, because I have a feeling, like, tomorrow, like, I'm going to be inspired to do something again. I don't know. Being around people that basically I grew up, you know, with in the field. It's interesting whenever I see people that I worked with, like back in the day, like when I was in my early 20s, it, and they're still doing it, like it doesn't make me want to go back and do it again, ever. If anything, it makes me realize that I'm very happy not doing it. Um, but I'm also somebody that does something, and I think that this is a, this is, like when people decide to retire or resign or leave a job, like you really have to ask yourself this. And I think this is why, like, I would see so many people leave and then come back. And I was like, when you leave, you're gonna leave for good. Like you're not gonna come back. And um, so, you know, like one of the reasons that I think that that happened was, I mean, I was really done when I left. Like it was time, you know? And every stage of my career that I've like left, I've like, okay, it's time. Like I'm done. Like I've, I've done everything I wanted to do within the field. I've spoken at this conference. I've done this. I've, you know, I've done everything. So. piece we talked a lot today about me having more of like a structured schedule with my writing where like I get up and like I almost like clock in like I go to work you know like I go to get coffee and then like at the same time every day I write and I schedule that into my day as if that's my job so like if I work like if I write from like 10 to 2 and like let's say if somebody's like calls me and says like oh do you want to go out and have lunch at 1 I'd say, no, I don't get off work till two. And I actually,
actually think that's probably a pretty good idea for me because I can get easily distracted. And I think that if I want to like write like a professional writer, I have to act like I'm writing like a professional writer, if that makes sense, you know? And almost every writer that I've ever interviewed or I've ever known that does write and pays their bills that way, like Jackie Collins or Charlene Harris, you know, all these great writers that I've had the ability to interview back in the day for our website, you know, like, they all did that. Like, they all got up and wrote like it was their job. And a lot of them physically went to other places and wrote, which is why I'm like really resistant to getting rid of my office, you know? Like even as, we, like I wouldn't have to have my office right now for doing like, you know, the team building stuff. Um, I mean, I could always go to where they are and meet them or, you know, meet at some place off site. Um, I don't have to even have it, but I enjoy having a place that I can go to. Um, and it's not like it's, you know, breaking me financially that I can't keep it. So, I'm like, you know, it's kind of nice to have that place. That's like this private Catholic school, and I can remember when it was like I would drive by here, and it was. Do you hear my uh, windshield wipers? And it was uh, like trailers when they were building it. So funny how the world changes, isn't it? Where were we the other day? And I was like thinking that to myself. Alex and I went somewhere, and I was like, Oh God, I remember when this was like cornfields. <sighs> I think that life is really cool and that you can like kind of you know like figure out where it is you want to be five or ten years from now and start working towards that and even if you don't even see that you know being fully realized putting a little bit of effort into it every day I'm somebody that lives more in the dream than in the reality so for me it's not hard to like get an idea you know, when I was really, really young, I was constantly doing puppet shows and, you know, writing musicals and uh, putting on shows for my parents and writing books and writing songs and, you know, doing all kinds of imaginative things. And I never remember, like, uh, not thinking that it wasn't going to happen. I just... or thinking this is too too much to do I could just see the end product you know I could see myself like doing the show or whatever and um, I'm very similar to that today I have no problem seeing the end result it's just how to get there I think is where I find the problem if that makes sense like I don't have any problem of seeing myself with you know six different books written and me touring um, and talking about it I just struggle figuring out how to get to that point. But I can realize, I can see it in my head as, as real, as a realization. Oh, the yellow light's on and we're almost at 30 minutes. Peter, maybe you need to check out your camera a little bit more often. Um, but I don't know if that makes sense, but I, you know, I don't know. And I'm a believer that you can, you know, accomplish any dream that you want out there. I mean, that's not just bullshit when I say that, you guys. You know, I don't just say, you know, follow your dreams, you know, all that. I really, truly do believe that. I really, truly do. You know, and I think that if your dream is to be an Oscar-winning actress in Hollywood, well, chase that dream and maybe you'll find some other dream on your way. You know, maybe you never do make it to the acceptance speech. But maybe you end up becoming a script girl and, you know, you find the love of your dreams and you guys, you know, work on movies for the rest of your life together. And, you know, if on your dying breath somebody says to you, how was your life? You say, I can't imagine a better life. I had the most amazing life in my entire life. But you would never have known that had you not chased your dreams. You know, if your dream is to be the best chef in the entire world or make the best cupcakes, you know, you don't even have to leave your own kitchen to do that. But whatever your dream is, chase it. You know, I, I feel so blessed to have had two parents that said, follow your dreams. Do whatever it is that makes you happy, you know? Um, 
And I always have. I always have, you know, followed my dreams. It hasn't always been easy. There have been times that have been very, very tough. Um, but there's not a lot in my life looking back that I say, I think to myself that I wish I had tried or wish I had done. There's, I've done almost everything I wanted to do, you know? And uh, the business ventures that pay my bills today, interestingly enough, just kind of came out of nowhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, so I, I think a lot of times when you're doing what the universe is telling you to do, the universe aligns for it to happen that way for you. Not always. Not always. There's been many moments where I was worried about how I was going to pay a bill. It's going to shut off any second. Because I'm right at 30 minutes. Okay. So I'm back. Um, I was like trying to keep that thought in my head while I let it, like the camera cool down for a couple minutes. Um, but there have been like, you know, many moments in my life where like I was really struggling financially and all that kind of stuff. But I... It didn't really matter because, you know, I was doing things that I loved. And, you know, when I worked in treatment, I remember there were... I, 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 listen, you know, when you're a social worker and you're working in treatment as a counselor, you don't make great money. You just don't. And, I mean, th there are some places that pay very, very well, I'm sure. You know, but... I worked for a not-for-profit organization. The money just wasn't great. And that was really never why I was in it to begin with. So I didn't really care as long as I could pay my bills. But there were days, you know, we would say <laughs> we are paid way too much for what we do. And there are other days that we would say we're not paid enough for what we do. And, um... I wore every, I think, every single hat that you could possibly wear in that organization at one time or another, you know, other than being the CEO. <laughs> um, or the CFO. But I'm also a believer in paying your dues as you work your way up, you know, like... I think it's very important to start at the ground level and work your way up. I think you'll be respected later. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why I was, because people knew that I had started off as, you know, a tech that would do any shift and do anything that was asked. Um, I didn't just, you know, roll in there and be like, here I am. Excuse me. Lead counselor. But... I do have like a special kind of secret project I'm working on the side that uh, I have not mentioned anything about yet because I kind of want to do uh, the big reveal with it when it's complete and I'm excited about that. Um, and it does that does tie into my YouTube stuff. Kind of. It does. It ties into my YouTube stuff. So I'm excited about that. But... love doing the YouTube videos. I mean, it's so much fun, you know, to come up with things, that, new things to talk about. But I've always been like that. Even like, you know, like I would sit at home like and watch TV and think about like what kind of like group I wanted to do the next day and, you know, come up with some kind of creative group. You know, I loved doing that stuff. Um, always, you know. talking about it at lunch the other day because, you know, he was talking about kind of, like, working towards retiring and he's kind of ready to do that, you know, and I was telling him that I was, you know, thinking about closing down my office and just, you know, not even, and he was like, do you even really need it anymore? And I was like, no. I said, but I, you know, keep it open just, you know, for me and I meet in there sometimes for, you know, the, the projects that I do with the team building stuff and 
he was like, yeah, but you wouldn't really need it. And I was like, no. And he goes, but you're the same as me. He's like, he goes, I typically use my office now for, you know, like going in there and reading and things like that. I'll go get a coffee, you know, and the paper on a Sunday morning and go in and read for an hour, you know, before your stepmom's up. And then I come, he gets up very early. And he's like, then I come home and it's kind of, you know, like my place to go to and read, and, you know, and he's like, I, if I close down my office, I won't have that. And I was like, well, you could keep your office open. And he was like, for what reason? <laughs> he was like, you know, like, you kind of get to that point where it's like, why keep it open? And, um, but I also feel blessed to have my office where it is. Like, I'm right in the heart of a very cool district, and I love that. And, um, somebody said something on my video the other day. They're like, why don't you make uh, more, like, why don't you film your videos in your office more? And I've been really thinking about that lately. Like, maybe, you know, keeping my office and, like, painting a wall. Because there's, like, I have a room in there that's completely soundproof that I, you know, has a has this stupid wall in it that I have these, like, uh, flower stickers on. You guys have probably seen it from back in the day. But I thought about going back in there and repainting it white and then using it as like a back wall to like when I do certain videos and things like that. I thought, well, I could always do it there, you know? In fact, I just thought Tanya and I could do the eyelash video there. I hadn't thought about that. Um, and Melissa just got her bathroom redone too. And she was like, well, you can always use my bathroom to do the eyelash video if you want to. I do not have Wi-Fi in my office, though, which makes it kind of difficult. But I could always get Wi-Fi. That would be super simple, wouldn't it? Just to call up and be like, hey, can I get Wi-Fi? I know you guys are like, why don't you have Wi-Fi in your office? Because I've never needed it. <laughs> it's weird. I remember when I got my first office, and... Um, this woman that had been kind of a mentor to me, she was in the same office building. The office had three offices in it. And, um, like, two of the people were leaving, and she was moving to the back, which was, like, the biggest office. And so she called me, and she said, you know, do you want to start seeing clients? And I got very nervous. I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And she's like, I think it's time. And I was like, okay, so... Um, she's like, I've got somebody for you that I think would be like a good client. And it was actually like the mother of an addict. And, um, so I moved in there and I remember I got like, the office was very cool. They actually, they, well, I'll tell the story. It's kind of a sad story. So, I mean, it's not really a sad story, but... <laughs> to me, there's parts of it that are sad. But anyway, so I moved into this office. This office was beautiful. And it was like this one-story building. It was like this old house. And it had like stained glass windows and stuff. And we shared like a waiting area and a bathroom. And so anyway, um, I can't even remember what year. I have no clue what year I moved in there. Um, but it was with my ex. So I would say at some point, like, I mean, I'm probably, this is like 2003 maybe 2002 so I like moved in there and um I remember I bought this old couch from Goodwill and we like staple gunned it with this fabric that I found and I bought these two patio chairs that I actually still in my have in my office today from Target they're like really nice like wood they don't look like patio chairs but and some tables and stuff. And I said this little office, you know, and um, I was so excited, you know, when I started that. I was so, so excited. And um, I was like, here I am. I'm finally doing what I always dreamed of. And so I was in that office for probably two years. And we had this kind of like sketch landlord. I wouldn't say he was sketch. He was just very, like, New York landlord. You know what I mean? Like, you'd ask him to fix something, and two months later, he'd fix it. And, um... So... The woman that I had 
just go by me. I'm so tired of this on this road. So the woman that um, had referred me there, she I came in one day and she's like, well, I'm moving out. She's like, I've had it, I can't do it anymore. And I was like, okay, okay. And she was like, but he doesn't have anybody else for the office, so do you want this back office? And I was like, yeah, sure. And at that point, it had been like, when she left, I was in the front, her, her husband was in the office next to me doing counseling, and she was in the back doing counseling. So it was three counselors in the office. And um, then when she moved out, oh my God, we went through a group, well, I went through a group of people. So I moved into the back office, which was fantastic. And I had a little side door back there, and it was right across from this bar in Broad Ripple that had been around forever. And like, I mean, you could sit out front on a Sunday morning at like 10.30 and see the drunks roll out. And um, so anyway, uh, we, so when I moved into the very back, I, I loved that office. I just was so excited to move back there. I remember the night that I moved in there and it was like a summer night, like in July. And, um, my mom came and she helped me and my ex move in there and she went and got us Wendy's and we all sat like in my office with like the doors open and there was a band playing in the bar across the street. And my mom was so excited about me moving into that office. And she was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. And you're going to love being here and I did I loved being there you know it was like I don't know it just it like it felt perfect in time for me and uh so that was my second office and I was there until Alex and I got together and then I was there for so Alex and I met in August of 08, and I moved out of that office in, oh gosh, I think like the following August, um, maybe, the following summer sometime, maybe June of like 09, and uh, I can't remember when, it was sometime that following summer, but I don't think it was real late, I think it was like June of that following summer, and um I came into my office one day. So I had gone through a lot of like partners in my office. Like at one point I had a barber, he moved out. I had an attorney that was in there, he moved out. Um, at the end it was an attorney and a woman that was an esthetician and they were both fantastic. And um, so I came in one day and the attorney was like moving his stuff out and I go, what are you doing? And he was like, did you not, do you not know what's going on? And I was like, no. He was like, did you get the notice about, you know, that he's filing bankruptcy and closing the building down? I go, yeah, but he said, but we had like three months. And he was like, yeah, but like the electricity could be turned off at any moment. Well, I kind of just was like out of sight, out of mind. Like I couldn't really believe that I was going to have to like move out of this office that I had been in for like six or seven years, you know, that I was like in love with. It was like my second home and I spent so much time there and I was like, I can't like, I just kind of got frozen. Like, you know, like I just didn't really want to believe it. And, um, I didn't look for an office and I kept on looking like in a certain, like if I did look, I would like kind of just drive up and down the street in a certain area. And I thought very much about, I wanted a duplex and like a house and um, to have like half of the house. And I just, I don't know. I don't even know what I was thinking. And so finally, like my landlord came to me one day and he goes, you know, I'm closing the building down in like two weeks, right? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, you haven't said you're moving out on any certain day. And he was like, have you found something else? And I said, no. And I just like was kind of stuck. Like I didn't really know what I was doing, you know? And, um, I was driving home that day and I was like sitting at the stoplight or stop sign as I was going home and I like looked up and there was a sign that said office for rent and I ended up going in there and like, or I called the number and then she said, well, come meet with me. And I remember these offices because the woman that had originally referred me to the building that I was in, she, that was kind of my mentor back in the day, she had 
originally been in these offices where I'm at now, but she was in a really small office, and I didn't like them at all, and I knew I didn't want to be up there, and then it was so funny, because I went up there, and I met with this woman, and she had lived across the street from my, my Aunt Kathy, and she knew my mom and everything, and didn't make me pay a deposit, and she was fantastic, and um, it just, it felt like it was supposed to happen, but... I remember the day that I was supposed to move, you know, I really wanted it to be this like long thing and you know, I'm always somebody like I've said in here that says goodbye to hotel rooms and all kinds of crazy shit and you know, I really wanted to take my time moving out of that office the way that I had taken my time to move into it and Alex had taken the day off and he was going to help me. Well, that day when we were moving stuff around, you know, he called me and he said, I was like, I had gone to go get coffee and he goes, hey listen, he goes, I got tickets to like Third Road and Maroon 5 tonight. And I was like, okay, well, are you? who are you going to take? And he was like, well, I want you to go. And and I was like, I'm moving my office. I'm going to be, I plan on doing it for a long, you know, and I had thought like, you know, I'll just move my stuff and then go sit in my office one last time and play some music and light a candle. And, you know, I had this weird, I, 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 anyway, that's just, you know, my way of saying goodbye to stuff and being attached to it. And I said, but I'm moving. He goes, well, we can get it all done before the concert. And I said, no, I, I want to spend the whole night doing this. And he was like, we can get everything moved before we go to the concert. And I got like very resistant to it. And so finally he was like, this is like really, Maroon 5 is one of Alex's favorite bands. And he was like, this is really important to me. I got these free tickets. I really want to go and I want to take you. And I was like, okay. So I was like, we'll go. And I was kind of bitter about it. We ended up having this great time. Oh my God, the concert was fantastic. We ended up having so much fun. But I didn't even want to move into this new office. I was bitter about it, you know? And so we went to that concert. And then, like, I moved into the office. And it was funny because, like, uh, two days later, I had to take my keys back to the landlord. And I never even liked this landlord, okay? Like, we didn't even, I mean, we didn't not get along, but I didn't love him. Like, he was always very, like, put you off if you needed something done. I mean, he just was, he just wasn't very present, let's just say that. And, but he was, he was okay. And so I remember I took the keys back and I was sitting there in the parking lot, which was like two spaces. And he showed, he pulled up and I got out to give him his keys. And uh, he looked at me and he said, he was like, we had a good run, didn't we, you know? He was like, you were the last one that made it. And I got, like, so upset. Like, I still to this day don't know why it makes me so upset, but it was kind of the end of an era for me, you know? It was, like, my first office that I ever had that I actually made it, like, on my own, you know? When I left and went out on my own, so many people, like, said right to my face, you'll be back. You know, jokingly, sarcastically, oh, you know, you won't make it out there on your own. You'll be back. And I fucking made it on my own, you know? My entire life, people have doubted me. And he was like, you know what? It was a good ride, wasn't it? Those were his exact words. We had a good ride, didn't we? I was like, yep, we sure did. And then I really hated my new office. <laughs> but then it was like a night, like, the reason I know it was in June when I moved in there, I think, because like in July they have this like wine walk through Broader Bowl where my office is, where like all the art galleries are open and stuff. And it was that night that was like a week later. And, um, or two weeks later or something. And, uh, I can't believe that makes me cry still all these years later. And I had like seen some clients and I remember it was like that night and I like opened all the windows in my office and I, it was like the first time that I had been there at night and I had like the, the lights on but like it was like my office is very cool at night like it looks like a Soho off apartment, you know? And you could hear the bands playing on the street. You could hear people talking and walking. And I was like, oh my God, I love this office. Like, I, I had this moment. I just was like, I love this office. And, um... But I'm a different person than I am today, you know? And if I had to give up my office that I have right now, I don't think I would feel the same way. It's like... I'm 
very prepared to walk into the next step of my life, if that makes sense. And um, I just don't know what that necessarily looks exactly like yet. And I don't really like, you know, making drastic changes in my life unless I know exactly what it's going to look like, which is not how life works if you have been living in the same world that I have, you know? World, uh, somebody commented on, uh, the, they said a moat when I was talking about the house with a moat. There's the house with a moat right there. Um, but, you know, life throws curveballs at you all the time. And um, that's kind of part of the fun, I think, of life sometimes is trying to figure out what you're going to do with those curveballs and how you're going to handle them. Some curveballs, obviously, aren't so much fun to have to figure out. But, you know, I was talking to my counselor about all this today and things I want to do and bucket list life, excuse me, things. Not just places I want to go or stuff like that, but things I really want to do in my life, you know. Call it a career, call it a passion, whatever. And um, I said, he goes, you know what scares you? And I said, the risk of not knowing what's going to happen. And he said, you know what? He goes, but if I know one thing about you, I know this, is that you know that you're going to be okay. And I just like broke down like hearing that because like, I do know that today, you know, like I've been through so much shit in my life and it's like at some point you realize, you know, like you're going to be okay. No matter what happens, you're going to make it out. You're going to be okay and everything that happens to you is going to be an example of that. And you know, whatever you're going through today, you know, or whatever you've been through in your life, you're going to be okay no matter what happens. You're, it's not going to kill you. And then you can use those moments as teachable moments to other people or to yourself to remind you, hey, I'm going to be okay. And I, I've been through this and this is 10 times harder. And, you know, my camera shut off. But what I was saying was, you know, no matter what you're going through in your life, you're going to be okay. You know, like when I look back on my life, I've been through so many things that I thought I would never make it through, you know? But I did, and and to some degree, I'm better off having gone through it. And I think when you kind of just buckle yourself in for the ride, you know, and you realize that that's what life is all about, and you're going to be okay... then it's all kind of pretty great, you know? This water tastes so good. Do you guys think that water has a taste? I think water has a taste. <laughs> this is like one of those silly arguments you get into with your friends, but I think water has, its taste, has a taste. I was in my counseling appointment today. And he has these pictures on the wall. And they're right next to each other. And one is like the, this, they're like these watercolors and they're kind of abstract a little bit, but like one is like, they're both like the bottom of this one is blue and it's obviously like supposed to be the ocean. And then the bottom of the other one is like yellow and I don't know what it's supposed to be, <laughs> but I never noticed before that on this yellow one, there's like this guy like standing right in the middle. It's just like this little like stick figure. And so I'm like in the middle of talking about all of this stuff, you know, and we're having this really deep moment and, you know, I'm looking at him and, and he's like, you know, you know, you're going to be okay. And I said, yeah, I know I'm going to be okay. Like I've been through some just like horrific shit in my life and made it through and learned a lot of really great lessons. I never realized there was a stick figure standing right in the middle of that yell. And he starts laughing his ass off. And he's like, that is what I love about you. He was like, you crack me up. He's like, because you can do that and then go off and then come right. He goes, how do you do that? He's like, it's almost like an art. I go, I've lost my mind. I go, truly, I'm so ADHD that I cannot stay focused for two seconds. I said, but I have never noticed that there was a guy right in the middle of that yellow before. 
<laughs> He's like, you crack me up. Life is good though, isn't it? You know? At least one moment throughout the day because as I say that I know there will be somebody that comments and says well this and that and this and that and this and that is going on in my life and I know some of you have some really tragic lives you know and I know that the way that you escape or escape is by watching videos and watching my videos and it makes me feel very very happy that I can help you escape out of that you know if if even just for a couple moments throughout the day and I know you have some horrific shit that you're going through in your life. But if even in that horrific shit you can find just five minutes to, I don't know, pull up a funny meme and laugh at it or read your favorite poem or cry over a great memory or really feel something and feel alive just for five minutes, you know? And I think that it's all worth it on some level. But I want you guys to know I feel for you. I really do, you know. You share some heartbreaking stuff with me. And it makes me really realize how blessed I am. And it makes me realize how blessed I am that I've had amazing people there for me. At times that I felt my lowest. Um, life is tricky and none of us have it figured out, I think. Have you ever wondered what I'll say on my very last vlog? I've wondered that a lot recently. Like, I have no intention of quitting anytime soon. Like, I love doing this. But, like, I've always, like, wondered, like, I can see I can get crying even thinking about it, you know? Like, what will happen that very last night that I drive around? Oh my God, it just shut off again. I cannot believe it. Right in the middle of my emotional breakdown. I cannot believe that the camera shut off when I was in the middle. Did you hear that noise? <laughs> when I was in the middle of my emotional breakdown talking about my very last vlog. <laughs> that could be 10 years from now. <laughs> could be never. <laughs> I might just do them and then just one day. <laughs> um, but I thought about that sometimes. You know, it's like the end of the show. It's like the end of a TV show. You know, I mean, I think... I think being successful in life is sometimes knowing when to walk away from something, you know? And, uh, I do believe that. And, uh, trust me, I'm not ready to walk away <laughs> for a year and four months. But, uh, I'm not anywhere close to being ready, you know? I used to watch, uh, Will and RJ at Shep 689, and they did it for seven years, so I can do it for at least seven years. So I got five years left. Five and a half years left. But, um, or more than that. But I have thought about that. I thought, like, you know what will happen on my last vlog as I'm driving around, you know? It'll be the last thing I have to say. It's weird because I started this vlog. See, I'm getting, like, emotional even thinking about it. I started this vlog uh, out of a response to the fact that on my main channel, something was going on. This was like, you know, a year, year and a half ago. And I was losing a lot of subs. And I was like, well, I want to do videos that people that really like me are going to watch, you know, that if they're out there and they like me, that they're going to watch. And so I started this vlog because of that. And also because... Um, I wanted a diary of my life, you know, and I'd always wanted to keep a diary, like a daily diary, and I'm not very good at it. I'm not very good at, you know, I, I talk a lot about journaling, but I'm not very good at keeping a journal on a daily basis. And, um, so for a long time, I wanted to do it on a computer like Doogie Howser back in the day, and then I wanted to do kind of an artsy one, and I always kind of go through things, but then when I thought about vlogging, um, it was so funny because somebody said in my vlog last night, I said, do you remember when we used to call them vlogs? I, true story, I'm telling on myself right now, I used to call them vlogs when, um, 
John Green and his brother Hank, when I started watching them, I would call them the Vlog Brothers. I, you guys, I am such an idiot. I swear, I call them the Vlog Brothers. <laughs> Welcome to Peter's Vlog. Um, but no, I, you know, that's what I, why I started this was because, you know, I wanted to document like what was going on in my life that I could go back at any certain, you know, day and, you know, and look at trips that I've taken or, you know, moments with my dogs and, you know, and that's, to be honest with you, like, especially with my, you know, with Pee Pee getting sick and he's in so many videos, the dogs are in so many videos, it's really captured a moment you know, in my life, an era of my life, and um, you never know what's gonna change in your life. I have no video of my mother, except for that one wedding video that I still have not broken out yet and watched, because I don't know, there's like some weird fear of me, I don't know what it is, and then like I kinda just forget to go and look at it. And, uh, but I, you know, I want video of my life. And it was interesting because somebody said, you know, even if you don't put it on video, because my dad and my stepmom don't really want to be in videos. Um, and I respect that. I have friends of mine that have never once been in a video that I don't even talk about. They don't even want to be mentioned, you know? And, um, and I respect that. I think everybody has a right to decide if they want to be in a video on YouTube or not, you know? But, um, I do have video of my dad and my stepmom, you know? And, um, because they, somebody said, you know, you should at least have it for yourself. Well, I do. And part of the reason is because I don't with my mom. And that would be one suggestion, you know, that I would make to anybody on a very kind of superficial level. You know, get a camera, get your phone, record some video of your family. You never know if you're not going to have that. And just to see them in real time, you know, when you think back on what they were like. And you like to convince yourself you'll never forget. But you kind of do start forgetting at some point, you know, what they were like in real life. And um, you have glimpses of it. You have moments where you remember that. But I'm thankful forever for this vlog, you know. I can always look back and remember what those moments were like. So thank you guys for watching this. And I think you guys know how much each of you mean out there to me. That, you know, you come here every day and watch it. And allow me to continue to do this. I love this. I, I love my vlog. Um, so thank you. All right, you guys, listen, I'm going to get off here. And I'm thinking, I'm like, oh, I'm almost out of water. I'm going to get another water. And then I'm going to go home and go to bed. So I love you guys. And I will see you tomorrow. Bye.